And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. Welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. Well, today we're going to be here with the climate boogeyman. (laughs) The climate boogeyman. Well, he's not really. In fact, he's exposing the climate boogeyman. You you know, er everywhere you turn now, people are going to warn you about, well, climate change. They've got different names for it. I'm going to ask him some of them, but the greenhouse effect, uh, global warming, and, and, and you, you know, and, and this has been going on for, for some years. Uh, I remember uh, one time I went downtown. I took one to the doctor, and, uh, of course, I had a, you know, uh, she had a, a problem and, and with, her, with her leg, and she had a hip replacement. But I, I drove the car into the parking place there, and I got out of the driver's seat and went around to open up the door for her and had to get a wheelchair for her. And while I was doing that, some uh, homeless man came by, and he had uh, <laughs> he had made it his life work to be on the corner there. And everybody that stopped for any bit of time, he would warn them about the ozone layer. So there I was trying to help my poor wife, you know. <laughs> there she she couldn't even walk. I was getting a wheelchair and, and all that. It took me about uh, 45 seconds. And this guy comes up to me and said, sir. And I could tell he was homeless the way he was dressed. I said, yes. Do you realize you're violating the ozone layer a rule? I, I didn't know there was any rule. Well, he, he says there's not an official rule, but there's an unofficial rule. And, and you're parking too long and running your your motor, and that means it's going to get up in the atmosphere and the ozone hole. He gave me a whole lecture. He took longer on his lecture than I, I had done getting one out of the car. So I just looked at the guy. I said, hold it just a minute. Sir, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. I love ozone. I love these ozone holes, okay? And he looked at me like I was absolutely crazy. And I told him, you know, I love these ozone holes. And so he he walked back to the corner there and just sort of like he was defeated. But you know, <laughs> these people are everywhere. They're crazy. And they really believe the world is going to end anytime. They're all chicken littles. The world is going to end because of this climate change nonsense. Of course, the Bible says totally different. And uh, in, in the book of Ecclesiastes, it basically says, that everything is going to continue as it is now, you know, with all the seasons and, and so forth, until the end comes and Shiloh returns. Who is Shiloh? Well, that's a, a, another title of Jesus Christ. We know that, so we don't worry about these things, not at all. It doesn't mean we want to pollute and dirty the earth, but we never have one. In fact, you know, Christians are the best people for the earth <laughs> In the world, we like to keep our yard done. And in any case, there are these people out there that are absolutely wacko and nuts. And I don't think they've got a Christian perspective at all. And so they're worried about the earth and this climate change. Well, I've got a gentleman today, Mike King. And listen, if you're a, if you're a new age climate change person, you'll want to listen in. I think you're going to be crying a lot. Oh, you're going to be just moaning and groaning, and you can't believe that two adult men don't believe in global warming, and we're climate deniers, and we should be put in prison for it. We should be locked up and all this, and and, and you're going to have to go to your safe space so that you don't melt like a snowflake. And I understand that, but I'm sorry, but but, but I want you to listen in because we love you, and we'd like you to, to not get in, infected with this disease. This is a disease. And it's infected the world, and we're gonna we're gonna try to get you out of it. We're gonna get you, you know. First, we're gonna take your toes. We're gonna pull them out of the muck, and we're gonna go all the way up to the tip of your <laughs> your head. We're gonna we're gonna get you out of all that mucky and that, that junk stuff. Because I've got an author here named Mike King, M. S. King. Now, if you've got some of Mike King's books, you know they're great books. 
And uh, I don't know how he does it, but he just goes after the, <laughs> these controversial subjects. And he talked about the bad war. Now, you know, you've heard about the good war, World War II. But according to Mike King, there is no good war. There's only bad wars. And World War II might be the baddest of all. Well, he wrote a book about it. And boy, did that ever cause controversy. Because you're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to say they're good wars and bad wars and et cetera. But he said just the opposite. Man, did he ever cause controversy. But we offer that book here in the ministry, The Bad War, and we like it because it's true. And that's the thing about Mike King's books. His books are all true. They give you facts. They give you data. They, I mean, this is hard stuff here. And all of the world you'll find is absolutely nuts. But Mike King is right on, right on, on top of it all. Don't worry, we'll lead you through the muck, and we're going to have a good time doing it. Mike King, welcome to Power of Prophecy. Hi, good afternoon, Tex. Very good to be with you again. Well, I, I didn't know if I would see you again. You know, we had this hurricane uh, here in Texas, and uh, Harvey, and I, I thought maybe we'd all be gone. I, I guess I, I thought it was going to precipitate uh, a climate change, and we'd all be just vanished. I'm glad I hear your voice again. <laughs> yeah, you, you never know when it's... it's uh, we're all going to be uh, drowned, you know. Once that uh, uh, Antarctica starts to melt, we're, we're all going to be underwater. We're going to have to find a, a mountaintop. That's true. Yes, and uh, now I understand y'all had a big uh, hurricane several years ago, and the big boy, uh, the governor, uh, he made a big deal of it with the President Obama. What was that? Pre uh, was that a hurricane uh, up in New Jersey? Oh, Sandy. Oh, yes, yeah, Sandy. Yes. Now, you, you guys still have not gotten over week, that. Uh, huh? One week before the election, it got, it got Obama reelected. Wow. Well, you know, he deserved it because he did so much to stop global warming. Yeah, uh, well, you, you know, he once told a, a mob in Berlin, a, a huge crowd in Berlin, uh, this is the moment where, and this was, uh, he was running for president, and it was very strange, he was giving a speech in Berlin while he's a candidate, and it was 200,000 German imbeciles showed up to cheer him, and he was talking <laughs> about... Let this be the moment when we uh, determined that the sea levels would, you know, recede, would not rise anymore. You know, so, uh, hmm. you know, you, heard, you know, I guess Christ uh, calmed the waters. Uh, Obama was going to make them recede. Wow. Well, yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> well, let me ask, before we get into this, I want to ask you about some things that, that have occurred in the world and, and if they're true or not. For example, the ozone layer. I understand. Remember Al Gore? Kept talking about that hole, the, the ozone layer, uh, the hole in the ozone was growing and growing, and it was going to bring in all these uh, cancer rays. Is that true? Because they never want to talk about that anymore. Well, it's interesting, and I, I raised this issue in my book. Uh, you go back oh, 20, 25 years, the ozone, the hole in the ozone layer was, was the big crisis, and we were getting hit with that every day. Uh, that was even more hyped up than, uh, than global warming. And another big one was acid rain. Acid rain. Well, I remember that. They said all the forest yeah. would soon be gone. That's right. That's right. They, they were huge. So they were hitting us with acid rain, global warming, hole in the ozone layer. Then it just, it all stopped, and they went hard with just the global warming. And what I believe they did, Tex, is uh, the planners realized, you know, if we throw too many things out there, it's just too much out there. Too gets too complicated for for people. We want to give them one boogeyman to focus on, mm. and and they just dropped the hole in the ozone layer and the acid rain like a hot potato. I haven't heard about that in in years. They don't talk about it anymore. Well, I mean, what happened to it? Yeah, and you know what? We uh, have we have forests here in Texas, East Texas. We have the, what they call the big thicket, big thicket, yeah. and it's oh, it's, it's they say some people haven't even gone in certain areas of the big thicket. But it's as still as it's as big and as much a thicket uh, as it was when I was a little boy. Yeah, well, all of their all of their predictions and forecasts have never materialized. And mind you, now this is forty years. The global warming hoax was born in 1979. Those were the first so-called scholarly articles appeared in 1979. So we're almost going on forty years. Hmm. And at that time, and and you can look up. I mean, I've got some of these reproduced in, 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 in the book, Climate Boogeyman, uh, but they were making 20, 25, 30-year forecasts. We should have been wiped out like, you know, 10, 15 years ago, but they just keep pushing doomsday up another 20, 30 years. So it's always something that's in the distant uh, future. But this began 40 years ago, and all of their forecasts 
have been uh, uh, proven wrong because they're based on phony data. So the, these these scientists, so called, I mean, like Bill Nye, he's a, you know, he's a acknowledged one of the greatest scientists in the world. It's Bill Nye, right? We see I've seen him on TV and that tall yeah. skin. Isn't he one of the greatest scientists in the world? Well, uh, you know, he, he might be a pretty good high school science teacher, but as far you know, they they pump him up. He's never invented anything. He's never conducted any experiments. It's just amazing. The, there's some really tremendous men of science and invention out there who just toil in obscurity, and, and nobody knows about them except maybe their immediate peers. Mm. Uh, but they take these clowns, and they puff them up as the great voices of science. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson is another one. I mean, he's a nobody. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, uh, Al Gore, you know, I, I, I don't I don't remember any science that he has. He, I doubt if he's even taken a science course in high school. But he, no. I mean, they're, they're just glorified, <laughs> glorified high school science teachers who've been puffed up by the uh, the establishment and the media, and, and they play their role, hmm. uh, and they spread this disinformation. And but and this is all throughout academia. You look closely. Uh, that all of the, the so-called research being done into this climate change slash global warming, uh, 100% of it, uh, right, let me qualify that, I'll say 99% just in case, Virtually 99 to 100% of all global warming climate change, quote-unquote, science, is either directly funded by a government entity, such as the U.S., the mm. EU, the state of California, the U.N., et cetera, et cetera, or a left-wing foundation. Wow. So you have money and politics driving this thing, and these are the two most corrupting influences known to man, uh, money and power. And, and, and the entire fake science is completely steeped in this. And whenever you see one of these global warming authorities spouting his nonsense, just do a little research to him, and he's, he's either getting a grant, from a left wing or a government entity, or he's working for a university that is heavily funded by the uh, government. And, you know, and a lot of these guys, they, otherwise they would not be, they would not even be eating, you know? <laughs> There's a, uh, uh, you know. Uh, but there is a multi, multi billion dollar gravy train that is feeding uh, the scientists. And you put that kind of money out on the street text, you know, the, um, it's like putting horse manure on a hot sidewalk on a hot Texas day. The, the flies will come on their own. You know? <laughs> oh, no. Put that kind of money out, and you will get a certain type of individual who will say, well, listen, you know, I, I want to study this. I think you, you may be onto something here. So, that, you know, that's that's the way it works. They don't, even, they don't have to, like, physically recruit a scientist and say, hey, do you want to lie for us? No. You're, if you're involved in the field, you know darn well that if you want to conduct some kind of uh, nonsense study confirming global warming slash climate change, the grant money will be there, and lots of it. Mm. So that's how they operate the scam. Well, you know, I, I, I recall there's so many of these scams out there, according to the, you know, the climate change people. But uh, I remember one of them, I think I was about, oh, this is over 50 years ago, but this was a big one. And I remember reading about it in National Geographic and, Reader's Digest, but evidently they said that the desert, the great, you know, uh, Sahara Desert uh, in Africa was growing. And it was growing, it was galloping, and like 10 or 12 feet a year it was growing. And they said, you know, by, by the year 2000 there would be no no life anywhere on on the African continent because it would all be Sahara Desert. And that, uh, you know, these huge, you know, big waterfalls they have there and all that would all be dried up and, and, uh, you know, it, it caused me some concern. I'd never heard about that before. But then about 20 years later, I'm just reading this little bitty article, like on page 48 of the newspaper. And it said that that had reversed itself. And, and suddenly the desert started getting smaller. So it, I don't know how the scientists figured I was going to get bigger and then smaller. And, uh, you know, now they, they have gone down and got, they've got the kids. This is sort of a sad thing. But I, but I, I remember seeing these pictures of these children who were crying, Mike, because they had seen this film about the polar bears dying. They couldn't swim, they said, and they were trapped on some uh, iceberg that had melted. And there were these polar bears, and they couldn't swim very far, and they were all going to drown. 
And these kids, they had them all crying. They said this is because of global warming. All these uh, polar bears were going to drown. That was a pure hoax, wasn't it? Oh, it's 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 a, a, a total lie. I, I mean, so much of this is um, well, all of it. it. It's not a it's not a question of the scientists that made an error and the error got institutionalized. This is all concocted. The, the business behind with the uh, polar bears, it's uh, it's completely the opposite. It's really they really got bold with the polar bear lie. The polar bear is the poster child of of uh, climate change, global warming hoax. But a few facts about the polar bears. They, they've been known to, to swim for days on end. In, in fact, the, the record for a polar bear that has been tagged, they have these devices, I guess, they tranquilize them, they put a device around their ankle and they could track them. They once tracked a polar bear swimming 900 miles wow. uh, nonstop over a period of 10 days. Man. That's what they do. I mean, they have so much blubber that they're, they're buoyant, so swimming for them is, 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 is essentially effortless. They swim... It's probably easier for them to swim than it is to walk. Yeah. They can swim hundreds of miles. So they can even swim up. To, I, I mean, imagine swimming from like I don't know, like New York to uh, Cleveland nonstop. <laughs> yeah, uh, and yet they show these images of uh, polar bears who appear to be in the middle of nowhere swimming, and and that's to give you the impression that they, you know they have nowhere to go because everything has melted. But it's completely nonsense. Even the cubs, within a few weeks, they can swim for a couple of days on end. Hmm. So, and apart from that, even though the Earth is not warming, the the irony is, Tex, when the weather is a little bit warmer, the the polar bears thrive. They prefer a little warmth to extreme cold because they are primarily ice hunters. So they they like to, what they'll do is they'll smash the ice with their paws and then, you know, create a hole and that's how they catch their seals. Uh, But but when winter is a a bit colder and a bit longer than... uh, than usual, the ice gets too thick, and, and the bears struggle. Hmm. And they have they have to go and scavenge. So everything is upside down that they tell us. Wow. So you know it, it's perfectly normal for bear to swim hundreds of miles, and it, it's normal for bears to scavenge for food and like in dumpsters and things like that. Uh, but all of it, I, I mean, there was a picture in the New York Times on the cover. This was a few months ago. They had pictures of polar bears scavenging through. Um, some dumping ground in Alaska. And that was their evidence that, uh, you know, they have no place to hunt, so now they have to scavenge. Uh, that's a complete lie. All bears scavenge, uh, whether it's a black bear, grizzly bear, polar bear, they're, they're, they're all scavengers. The polar bear is a hunter and a scavenger, but they'll do both. Hmm. So, the, you know, but, you know, that's what they do, Tex. They do selective evidence. They'll take a picture of a polar bear swimming in the middle of nowhere and they'll use that to prove something that is not. Or they'll take a picture of a polar bear going through a dumpster, and they'll use that to prove that there's no food for them. And people will buy this nonsense, especially the the kids. And uh, so now they form an emotional attachment to the global warming hoax. And, well, you know what that means, because now when you present them with with, with evidence, you know, you're you're really, they really feel threatened. Uh, by that, because they made their emotional attachment to the polar bear. Mm. Uh, so it's really evil, manipulative stuff that they're doing to the children. And this has been going on so long that many of those quote-unquote children are well into adulthood now, and you still can't get this nonsense out of their head because of what they learned when they were little kids about the uh, the polar bear. You, you know, uh, Mike, there's so there's so much of this stuff. Now, I'd, I'd like to know where all this got started. What Was there, you know, a conspiracy? You know, people uh, laugh about a uh, smoke-filled room uh, of the elite with the cigars uh, and so forth. They're plotting out some conspiracy against we the people. But that's, that really is true. That really does happen. But it, it seems that th- there's more to it than that. I, I, I'm wondering how this stuff gets started. Because there was, you know, there was no environmental movement uh, as such. There was no climate change uh, movement back in the 70s. And then it just seemed like somebody turned on a, a light switch. Right. Yeah, well, that's always an indication of something uh, something conspiratorial afoot. When you see something come out of nowhere as if someone flicked the switch. And although this business... Uh, about the New World Order and the One World Government Movement. I mean, really, this dates back to French Revolution days. 
the environmentalist component of it really kicked into high gear, and I start this right at the very beginning of the book. 1970 was the first annual Earth Day, and all the newspapers and magazines and Walter Cronkite, they did a big special. They really pushed it hard in 1970. This was the first Earth Day. And all the hippies, you know, they latched onto it. There were massive demonstrations across the country. Many of the organizers were known communists. So this was like the beginning days of uh, the environmentalist movement. And, and they really had, hadn't really focused on any issues yet. It was, it was just this generalistic, you know, there's this pollution and it's doing harm. And um, just to be aware of it. It's not until the late 1970s that the, the global warming hoax was hatched. However, uh, as I point out in my book, during the 70s, they were going to go a different route with this. There was an Ice Age scare, which I'm sure you remember. Mm -hmm. Anybody who's probably over 45 or 50 will remember the 1970s. It, was, uh, it wasn't like the mania of today with global warming, but it was... Uh, it went on. It was. It was. People were aware of it. There was an ice age scare. And there were I remember. Many, many I remember there were pocket books at uh, the bookstore and such, warning about uh, ice yeah. age. And uh, uh, you know, you were we we're going to have another uh, big ice age. It was. Uh, it was pretty big at yeah, that time. And some of the and some of the, the so-called scientists were linking it to CO two. Can you believe it? Hmm. So and now here's the thing: the seventies were cold, particularly in the United States and Northern Europe. It was colder than normal. There were a lot of snowfalls. And it was just one of those things, you know, weather goes through cycles. So it was a, a colder than normal uh, period. Uh, but then it began to pass. And, and I believe, Tex, that they abandoned the Ice Age scare in favor of the global warming scare because I, I think it's harder to lie about a coming Ice Age because when you have an Ice Age and it's, it starts to advance year by year, you can literally see the glacier line moving southward year by year. Uh, all of a sudden, there'll be towns that have some snow on the ground all year round that never happened before, and it just goes a few miles south every year. It's a little difficult to pull that off. And then what happened is at the end of the 70s, we started, we didn't start warming up. We just went back to kind of where we were in the 60s. It's just, the 70s was just an aberration. And so on a dime, they switched from Ice Age scare to global warming scare. And one of the founding fathers of the global warming hoax you know, a scientist, so-called scientist named Stephen Snyder. He's a big guru of Al Gore. He died a few years ago. But this is one of the big, big names of global warming. In 1978, he was an ice ager. And there's actually a YouTube video. It shows him appearing on an old uh, show called In Search of a Member Nemoy. This is 1978. And they had him on there as one of the experts and the authorities. And he's confirming uh, that we are entering an ice age. This is 78. 79... I've got him quoted in the Washington Post. He's talking about, you know, 20, 30 years from now, we're, we're going to be launching boats off the steps of Capitol Hill in, in Washington from the rising sea levels. I mean, so he just made a complete and total about face. So, again, that is an indication that, uh, you know, they're still trying to decide which way they were going to go with the CO2 hoax. Were they going to push an ice age or global warming? And they went with global warming because that's the... Uh, probably much easier to pull off because, you know, you could tell, you could talk vaguely in generalities, whereas with, with an ice age, you have to show an advancing glacier line, which uh, uh, did not exist. But that's how quick they, you know, you talked earlier about how they flick switches. They went from ice age to global warming within a year's time. Well, you know, I, I remember the report from Iron Mountain. You remember that, uh, Mike? Yeah. The report from Iron Mountain, uh, they published this book, and supposedly it was a real book, is a real report about these uh, so-called experts. And I do believe it because uh, I can't remember the names exactly, but uh, one of them in particular was a big uh, a member of the uh, uh, John F. Kennedy administration. And he said it was true. He had been a member of it. But they, they decided to meet and decide. You, you know, they said that the earth is always progress from age to age based on war people of uh, fighting wars and if they said if they got rid of the wars what would people do they needed some kind of activity and the people would have to you know it would be a huge activity that everyone would get involved in everyone be concerned about they you know named a, a number of different activities this was supposedly a government project 
and they named uh, different projects. One of them was the environmental movement, of course. Another was the, the space program and so forth. But the, the environmental program, the interesting thing was I understood that, uh, that John F. Kennedy had already been approached. And uh, he said no to the environmental movement because he believed in industry. He believed in the economy. He believed uh, that, that, that you know people needed jobs. And he saw that the environmental movement was a big hoax. Of course, nobody talks about that anymore. But uh, he evidently saw the flaws in, in their, uh, uh, you know, their, the chinks in their armor right away. But it took uh, LBJ to really bring this thing into into motion, didn't it? Yeah. Or well, it was, it, was, it was incremental. I, I, I mean, when the first Earth Day began in 1970, we, we did not have an EPA. But what uh, what it Earth Day did is it kind of created enough pressure that Nixon went along with establishing the EPA in 1970. And it was originally small and limited in terms of its power. Now it's a, a, a massive dictatorial agency. Yeah, Nixon really shafted everybody, didn't he? Gave us the EPA and gave us all this junk. Yeah, I, I mean, a lot of it was forced on him. There's other political forces at, at work. I mean, I mean, you know, Nixon was just, I don't know, kind of individual who, I mean, he had certain beliefs and convictions, but at the same time, he could be rolled because he was also very political. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, he should have never given us the EPA. Uh, he should have known better that, you know, even though it wasn't that big of a deal when it was established, when you take a historical view of these things, you know, every monster starts out as an embryo, you know. <laughs> That's right. So, so you know, it took a while for the EPA to get to the point where, you know, where it is today. And they could unilaterally declare CO2 to be a pollutant, which is the most ludicrous. I, I mean, that's, that's like saying oxygen is a pollutant, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, CO2 is plant food. It, it's good for the environment. Plants love it. Uh, the plants uh, absorb the CO2 and they give us oxygen. So, uh, but that's the point that we've arrived at. This agency can just ban CO2. Um, uh, and fortunately, one of the good things that Trump has done in, in, uh, in the months that he's been in office is that they're putting curbs on this uh, nonsense. Um, and the EPA now, the director of the EPA, uh, Pruitt, you know, the New York Times, they hate him because he's a, quote, climate change denier. Uh, but that's actually a good sign. Yeah, uh, it seems that Trump is really doing some great things uh, here, and I can understand why they they just hate the man because he's, yeah, well, he's two, two things mainly text it, and this explains all the hatred. Mm-hmm. Um, one is he wants to have good relations with Russia, and he refuses to continue going down this road towards confrontation. Uh, so Russia is one, and then secondly, it's this global warming nonsense that he doesn't buy into. Both of those are major agenda items. I know you have a book for sale, one of my books um, that you sell, uh, The War Against Putin, mm-hmm. which we talked about last year. Um, and then there's this global warming business. So Trump is good on both of those issues. And you understand that. You understand the hatred uh, being leveled against him. Oh, you really do. He, he killed this uh, Paris uh, climate uh, treaty and all that. Uh, that, was just, yeah. that was just a song. I give the guy full credit. Uh, there are things that he's done already that uh, I have to applaud. And to think what we would have gotten with Hillary Rodham Clinton. Man. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I mean, we would be really on the brink of war already. We really would. Well, Mike, we're going to have to take a little break here. And we'll be right back with the second half. we got a lot more to cover on this climate boogeyman. Uh, let me just give you the subtitle of it. It's the Criminal Insanity of the Global Warming and Climate Change hoax it's a hoax folks don't believe it things are going to continue just as they are right now we're going to have weather bad weather good but it's going to continue the climate change is a hoax and mike king is going to tell you more about that when we return you're listening to power of prophecy Well, this text Mars again. You know, this book, Climate Boogeyman, it's the best book I've seen that talks about climate change from 
a sane standpoint. Now, you know, you would think, well, now some people would say, well, golly, I don't know if I can take all these statistics. And listen, this is not just statistics. This, th this talks about people. This is, I mean, this is everything you'd want to, I mean, I, I've never seen a book like this. Pictures, all kind of pictures in it. And by the time you finish this, you'll understand what's going on. The new world order will save the earth. You, you see the connection there. The new world order will save the earth. Of course, it's the elite. And of course, there's a huge climate tax scam involved in this. They want to, well, they want to tax you more. And I'm going to ask Mike King about that in just a moment. But I, I want you to have this book. And listen, we're offering, it's a big book. Uh, it's almost 200 pages or so. Uh, and it's a, it's a large format. It's about twice as big as the typical book. Okay. So it's one of these large books. And I think you'll, you'll just enjoy it so much. And, uh, listen, it's not the kind you put in your back pocket. You know, it's not a little pocket book. It's a big book. And it gives you all these pictures. This is just a terrific book. Uh, and, and I don't know of anybody that could do this except M.S. King. He's done it with other books. He did it with a book on Putin, which, by the way, we have. If you'd like to call us on that, you'll find out why these uh, these lying dogs of the press <laughs> want us to hate Putin uh, and the Russians and why they're trying to claim, you know, this Russia, Russia, Russia conspiracy, which is nonsense. But uh, uh, M.S. King has a book on that. And we offer that. So we, we have these various books, but this, I, I think, is one of the better books that M.S. King has done. And I hope he keeps offering books like this because they're unique. They're really, really needed. And, you know, you can give this to friends and they'll, they'll see it. They'll read it. And uh, it, it's just a great book. Now, we're going to offer it to you for just $20. All right, $20. That's a good deal. Well, please add $5 shipping and handling, a total of $25. As for the book, Climate Boogeyman, Climate Boogeyman, I like that title, Climate Boogeyman, and uh, we'll send it right to you. We have a number of copies here, and I'm sure Mr. King can get us some more if we if we need it, because this book is going to really, really sell. And uh, now, if, if you want to order it from our uh, website, powerofprophecy.com, you can go there and get it. Uh, if you uh, use your charge card, of course, if, uh, if you want to order it here at the ministry, do so. You can send us $22. That'll take care of the uh, postpaid. We'll ship it right out to you. And as you know, we don't play around here. We get books out immediately. Why? Because we respect you, my friends. We know. Well, listen, when you order a book by mail, you know, there's going to be some delay because of the mail. But we know you want your books, and we're, we're going to work overtime, if necessary, to get these books to you. I've never understood, Jerry, how, you know, you order a book, and they say, please allow three weeks for shipping time. What is that? We, we, we put these books out within a couple of days at the most. So we're going to get it right out to you. You call us if you don't get it, but you'll get it right away. And just give a little bit of time, of course, for the mail. We have this book for you, Climate Boogeyman, $25. Now, here's how to phone us, toll-free, 1-800-234-9673, 1-800-234-9673. You can write to us as a check or a money order uh, or uh, cash, $25. Please know now that when you uh, order anything from us, we give you another six months subscription to our Power of Prophecy newsletter. Absolutely free. Okay, we'll do that for you. We we automatically update our files every time you order from us. So, uh, again, our address is 1708 Patterson, P-A-T-T-E-R-S-O-N, Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. We've been here about 35, 40 years. It's the same place. We like it here. We're out in the country. And it's not so much country anymore. You know, Austin's really, really growing, but very pretty out here. Uh, we like it. All the animals and, and so forth. We got all kind of animals, don't we? Jerry, human and otherwise. <laughs> oh, man. But uh, in any case, here's the book again. One last time. Climate Boogeyman by M.S. King.
And now let's return to our regular show. And Ms. King is here with us on the uh, telephone from New Jersey. Are you still from New Jersey, Mike? Yes. We would like you to come down to Texas sometime and see us. <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I would. Yeah, I would. I would like that. Uh, never been to Texas. I did Arizona once. Uh, <laughs> I flew. I flew over you guys. But <laughs> now, on page thirty-seven of your book. I was reading about this ad campaign they had on TV, and I, I saw that ad. Tell us a little bit about that, who was involved in it, and, and what they what they claimed. Yeah, that was the known as the We Can Solve It campaign. It was a big marketing push. This was 2008. So the global warming scam at this time is about, it's about 30 years old. And, of course, the entire left wing, all the communists and liberals, progressive Democrats, they were on it from the very the very beginning. Uh, so now they wanted to expand the uh, the scam by um, uh, trying to remove that leftist taint from global warming. So the whole idea was to convince people that hey, this isn't political. You know, it doesn't matter what your politics are. Uh, it's our planet. You know, we're, we're all going to tie together. Mm-hmm. So to that end, they televised a series of, uh, of TV ads. So, I mean, this is big money was put into this. And um, I'll give you an example. One of them featured former Speaker of the House, the quote-unquote conservative Newt Gingrich, and the uh, at the time the current Speaker of the House, that would be liberal Nancy Pelosi. And so the TV ad depicts the two of them on a love seat at the beach with the shore behind them. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it's really nauseating. Uh-huh. It starts off, she says, Hi, I'm Nancy Pelosi, lifelong Democrat and Speaker of the House. Hi, I'm Newt Gingrich, lifelong Republican, and I used to be Speaker. And Pelosi continues, we don't always see eye to eye, do we, Newt Gingrich? No, but we do agree our country must take action to address climate change, Pelosi. We need cleaner forms of energy, and we need them fast, Gingrich. If we never must demand action from our leaders, we can spark the innovation we need. And then Pelosi closes the ad, urges uh, the viewer to go to WeCanSolveIt.org. Uh, there was another ad feeding, uh, uh, featuring the quote-unquote conservative Reverend Pat Robertson and the liberal Reverend Al Sharpton, who is a communist and a, a murderer. Uh, he, he has incited uh, riots on numerous occasions that ended up in innocent white people being murdered. So I call him a murderer. Uh, and there he is on the love seat with Pat Robertson. Oh my, uh, wait, 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 hold, hold, let, let's about, get the picture. Let me get the picture of this in my mind here. Pat Robertson. Oh, Right there on 38, I have the pictures of uh, um, the two scenes, Gingrich and Pelosi. Yeah, but, but I mean, uh, Pat Robertson and Al Sharpton on a yeah. on a beachfront love seat together talking about yeah, the need to solve global or climate change or global warming. That's right. you know, And neither one of these guys knows diddly about it. I'm, <laughs> I'm quite oh, sure. No. But that, that was the whole idea, and, and they really never succeeded. Uh, they, they wanted to make this thing non-political and convince Republicans and conservatives that, no, this is not a Marxist conspiracy. This, you know, this is real. It's okay to be a conservative and believe in, in, in global warming. But this is the kind of stuff that has influenced the public over the years. And that's what's unique about my book. I debunk the fake science and very simple to understand language. You don't need any kind of scientific background to understand what's in climate boogeyman. But at the same time, I go heavily into the fake news and the hype and the marketing campaign and, it, and I try to make it clear to people why it is that so many people came to believe this nonsense and it's not because of the science, it's because of 40 years, Tex. They've been hammering us with this nonsense for 40 years and like I said earlier, if you're 35 years old or younger, mm-hmm. you were hit with it in school during the 80s and 90s and now the younger kids are getting hit with it exceptionally hard. I mean, this stuff is mandatory. Every high school in America has an environmental science curriculum. So this stuff is being imposed on on children. And that's a big problem because, you know, it's going to get harder and harder to correct people on this as more generations of children pass through this brainwashing. Now, Mike, I'm, I'm sort of puzzled here because I have noticed that they're finding it harder to get people to believe this. I mean, you would think that it it has worked. I mean, they've got Newt Gingrich and Nancy Pelosi, you know, on a love seat together, pushing it and all that kind of nonsense. 
But evidently, just lately, the last few years, this whole thing is is dissolving. Right, in, they're they're embarrassed over it, but it's failing. Yeah. Your book is really going to help this, I'm sure. But, yeah, but you, you know, I, well, it is. They are having a hard time, in spite of it all. They're still having a hard time selling it. Which uh, I, I I guess we have maybe. I suppose we have to thank the internet for that, mm -hmm. because so much truth has gotten out there that um, you know, it's harder and harder for the the global conspiracy to get away uh, with what they used to be able to get away with. So, you know, there is hope in that respect. My concern is what they're doing to the uh, to, to the children. You know, you, you see already on the college campuses today, you know, it's just how uh, lost mentally and morally the, these little social justice warriors are. So, you know... I mean, we, we haven't won yet. We're, 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 we're been at, we've been able to delay them a bit, you know, with this thing. And hopefully, uh, under, under Trump, we can kill this global warming hoax altogether. Well, you know, I, I, I noticed it's that, uh, yeah. it, it seems like I, I know I, I can only, uh, compare this to the Holocaust movement, you know, where they, they claim there was a Holocaust. And the, the point is, uh, it, it doesn't, there's no, I mean, the Holocaust is over now. We don't have a Holocaust anymore if we ever had one. But then they started saying if you deny there was ever a Holocaust or deny the numbers involved, then, you know, you're a, you're a Holocaust denier, uh, and you need to be put in prison. You can't have free speech. And that's what they're saying now about climate change. If you deny any part of it, if you deny that the earth is, is going to be, you know, we're going to lose the whole planet, or that all the cities along on the beaches are going to be uh, totally washed out, and, and all this, all the polar bears are going to be dead, et cetera, et cetera. If you deny any of that, then you're a denier, and you need to be, first of all, they don't want you to speak. You don't have free speech. And second, they want to put you in prison right away, convict you as a uh, climate change denier. Now, they're actually doing this on the Holocaust. And there, there are hundreds of people across this planet that are in prison because they denied some aspect uh, of the Holocaust. Maybe they denied that it was six million or denied that it was mainly Jews. I don't know what they, you know, but the, some something they denied. Uh, and so they're in prison now for denying it for, for free speech. Now, they want to push this in America. Free speech is really, I mean, your book. I'm sure there's some professors at university that say, oh, my goodness, this M.S. King needs to be put in prison. He's got a book called Climate Boogeyman. It's denying a, a, a climate change. You can't yeah. do that. I mean, well, there's, there's, been a, there's a number of professors that are on the record saying that they would support this legislation, and Bill Nye has said so. Bill Nye has made the case that somebody's climate denial poses a direct a direct threat to his life because if this problem is not fixed, you know, so he's using the, uh, I mean, that's his whole argument that, you know, you can't, you can't use free free speech to uh, physically hurt somebody or incite violence or, you know, yell fire in a crowded theater. He's trying to equate that with, with this. Um, so, yeah, they would like to uh, outlaw uh, climate change denial. It hasn't happened anywhere yet. I would imagine Maybe one day you might see something like this happen first in you know in Western Europe where they're just totally insane. Uh, but yes, there are like 15 countries worldwide now that will put you in jail for Holocaust denial. So this, uh, I mean, that alone tells you all you need to know about whether something is true or, or not. You know, when you start threatening people with prison, it, it means you got something to hide. Oh, it's true. You know, I, I have I wrote a book uh, some years ago, Mike, called Codex Magica. In the book, it just so happens that there's a lot of pictures in it. Uh, and I have a, an illustration of a letter that I received from the uh, Ku Klux Klan uh, from the state of T uh, Tennessee. And the Grand Wizard there, whatever the, <laughs> the Grand Poobah, whatever he was, wrote me this letter threatening me. So, you know, I, I rather enjoy things like that. Uh, but he threatened me because I had this Jewish guy on my radio program. Uh, and he said he was going to come get me. I was vermin. You know, I was trash. And I dared to have this Jew on my program, and the Ku Klux Klan had my name, and they were going to come get me. 
So I put it in my book, you know, I saw it, you know, as uh, uh, insane, and I, I put it in my book. And then recently, they had this Southern Poverty Law Center that said, Tex Mars and Power of Prophecy are notorious anti-Semites. You know, they're with a the KKK. And I'm trying to figure this out. Now, <laughs> on one hand, I get a threat from the KKK, even put the, the, the letter in my book. From the KKK, you know, threatening my life. On the other hand, the Southern Poverty Law Center says, I'm with the KKK. <laughs> and that, that's about like your book. Obviously, they're going to tag you and say you're a climate denier. Uh, but they don't really go to your book. They don't, no one is going to go to your book and read it. This is the problem. And they haven't read my books, or nor, nor your book on the, on the bad war. That's the problem. They don't read our books. They they make up these stories about them. And, and pretty soon, the Southern Poverty Law Center has all these Christian groups th th that are supposedly anti-Semite or racist or whatever. And it's all pure nonsense, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, nobody has checked into their background, but that's a communist uh, front organization. And, uh, and here you have major newspapers referring to them as an authority source. But it just shows you how deep this problem is. You know, I mean, I, I mean the, the, the radical leftist groups out there, the, the Southern Poverty Group and the Antifa, that's just one end of the pincer movement. On the other end, you have the, you know, the respectable liberals who work hand in hand, uh, with them. So, uh, that, but that's what, that's what keeps them, Keep them going. They're, they're protected by the, the major media. You know, they don't refer to them as left-wing terror groups. They refer to them as uh, counter-demonstrators or anti-racists. You know. Yeah. Well, well I, you know, I want to see where all this is going. We have uh, uh, Donald Trump. He he canceled the Paris uh, Environmental Treaty, and you mentioned uh, Mr. Pruitt, who is now in charge of our uh, Environmental Protection uh, Agency. He's doing a good job. Uh, then the guy at the um, Interior Department seems like he's doing a good job too. Yeah. Uh, but you know, uh, Donald Trump is only in office for four years. Can these people like Donald Trump, like you and me, can we hold these monsters back? I mean, these these people are monsters, and and they've got all this money, these billions of dollars, all of these gigantic left wing organizations. And the United Nations and so forth, uh, as well as the political parties, Democrats and Republicans. How long can we hold them back? Uh, can we start a permanent movement, or are we just doomed to somehow be caved in in the future? What do you think? Yeah, well, you know, if you look at, you look at the struggle historically. There have been times in our history where, if I can make an analogy to removing weeds, where we've pulled the weeds but we didn't get the root. <laughs> mm. uh, and and it came back stronger than than, than ever. I mean, we we had a run in the 1920s of, of uh, constitutional conservatives, America first presidents. Uh, the election of 1924, both the Democrat and the Republican were both America firsters. Wow. Uh, the globalists had to run somebody third party just to get like a few votes. So um, you know, I'm sure back then people must have thought, well, we finally defeated them. We killed. We, we didn't join the League of Nations and, and uh, uh, the Republican parties controls everything and they're solid conservatives and we've uh, abandoned Woodrow Wilson and his legacy. But no, they were still there. They were not uprooted. You know, it's like a vampire. You have to yeah. count Dracula. You have to put the stake to his heart or he'll be back. <laughs> right. So, you know, although I applaud, uh, you know, Trump pulling this out of the Paris Climate Accords and, and, and what EPA Chief Pruitt is doing, you know, this is great. But, yeah, we, we definitely need to realize this problem is everywhere and it persists. The roots are not touched. They run very deep and very wide underneath the uh, the ground. So uh, ultimately, really radical has to happen if we're going to ever save ourselves from these monsters. So we just have to continue. It, it's a never-ending fight, isn't it, for, for, let's just say for God, for truth. For justice, no. uh, it, it's a it's it's a never-ending fight that we've got to campaign against these people. 
Because uh, it seems that they, uh, you know, Satan has these people. They're like on drugs or something. Yeah. You, you know, they're, they're insane. Like you, you gave your, uh, your book a great subtitle, The Criminal Insanity of This Hoax. These people are, you know, I noticed is the minute that uh, Trump was elected, these uh, many of these people came out of the woodwork, and there were just thousands of these people, uh, the the criminally insane. They came out, and I thought, wow, I, I I'm glad they did. I I had no idea that that many of them were out there, but it seems like you know somebody turned on the <laughs> somebody turned on turned on the motor, and they're everywhere. So yeah, we're fighting these guys. Uh, trying to do what's right, of course. Trying to tell the truth. And that's the real key. It. Isn't it a truth effort uh, that, that you're involved in here? Yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's the age old struggle. You know, it's, I, I guess it's a curse that will always afflict mankind. Uh, good versus evil. And I mean, that's just what it comes down to. And, uh, you know, we're at a particular moment in our, in our history where the bad guys really are in the driver's seat. You know, there's some, uh, there's, there's, there's some avenues of hope, you know. Um, you know, I, I, I look to Russia and, and, you know, what they're doing in resisting this new world order, you know, and hopefully this movement we have in this country with Trump can develop into something bigger. But like you said, it, um, you know, he's all alone out there, you know, and he's, he's not perfect himself. That's all we can do is, is that's what I just try to do is open people's eyes as best, as best as I, uh, I can. Well, Mike, I, I this think is, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's core. It's an information war. I think it's astonishing. Uh, you, know, but it, you know, forget about for a moment the, the really bad people and the crazy people. Um, we can't do anything about them, but if we could just win the decent folks mm. who have just been given bad information. Yes. Okay. Then that's, that's what I'm, you know, I, I mean, I'm aiming at. Uh, you're never going to convince a criminally insane Marxist, you know, uh, that what I'm saying is true. Their, their, their minds and their souls are gone. But there's still many, many millions of people, they just have never come across the right information. That's, that's right. And I'll tell you something, yeah. too. Uh, you know, we have a Christian ministry here. Uh, and we fight this in, in the Christian field, too. I mean, I notice here on page uh, 43 of your book, you have a section on the Catholic Pope who's jumped on the mm -hmm. climate change bandwagon. And you have quite a bit of information on that. But when ca poor Catholics out there, they, they want to do good, I'm sure. Uh, I know they have a lot of false teachings. Uh, but nevertheless, they have a leader in this Catholic Pope who is a Marxist, who is a Freemason uh, and a Jesuit. <laughs> you have everything you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, but, but he's for a new world order. Uh, and, and of course, he's pushing the climate change and the the earth and all all this. So it, it's very tough when you go to church and you hear the same junk. Uh, you go to school, you go to the university, and it's and it's reinforced throughout life, isn't it? All this junk. Yeah. I, I remember uh, uh. the uh, Southern Baptist uh, Convention. Uh, there was a guy named Richard Land, Doctor Richard Land, one of the top officials. Uh, in the convention, of course, 15 million strong. Uh, and he gave a, a talk. Uh, I heard it at the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, about 13,000 messengers there. Uh, and he said that the, the Great Commission is misunderstood. Uh, the Great Commission is, involves the saving not only of human souls, but the saving of our planet. And I thought, oh my, yeah. that was in the, in the Baptist, boy, they, they stood up and applauded the guy. Oh yes, that's yeah. the great, yeah. the great commission is the saving, not only of human souls, but of our planet. And I wrote the guy yeah. a letter and I said, are you, are you insane? Are you nuts? You know, you know, here, here this guy, you know, he's claiming he's, but, but this is the same thing the Pope is saying. And, that's right. yeah. and, and, and the, really the people out there, you know, I always recommend they just go to a little church. Go to a mom and pop church or have a home church. You know, it says in the That's Bible, right. where two yeah. or three are gathered in my name, there am I uh, with them. Yeah. Because, you know, you're, this is where you're going to see this, isn't it? If, if these huge uh, churches and such. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, you know, they, the globalists have left no stone unturned. So any 
type of institution out there that has the ability to, you know, influence people, they uh, they infiltrated their agents. Mm. Now, whether it's universities or, or, or the press, uh, of course they were going to go after the churches. So, you know, these these, these communists and Marxists, uh, they've infiltrated the various denominations. I mean, it's been going on for many, many years. I mean, Stalin was one studying to become a priest. That's and right. it's, it's not a case of, uh, you know, him being on the right path, and then he, he went off the right path. Uh, he was probably at one time considering becoming a priest so he can uh, uh, infiltrate and destroy the church from within. And there's plenty of such characters. Uh, and you look at this pope, he has a long history dating back to when he was a young priest mm. of these communist affiliations. So uh, I believe he's one such character who, who did infiltrate the church. Uh, you know, I suspect he's a homosexual. I have no evidence of that, but I'm just looking at the pattern of some of the people he's promoted. He's gone out of his way to promote some of the most radical priests who 20 years ago, when it was like unheard of in the Catholic Church, were openly calling for, you know, understanding homosexuality. Let's not condemn the act and, and so on and so forth. You know, here in Newark, I mean, he up here in the area, he appointed a new archbishop. He's archbishop of Newark, and he was at the, they have a grand cathedral in Newark, and he had a special ceremony, and he had homosexuals and cross-dressers in there as the guests of honor to say, welcome, I am I am your brother. I will not judge you, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's big on not judging, isn't yeah. he? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> it's, it's just a... Uh... Uh, astonishing. Of course, we have the same thing in the in the Protestant field too. It's uh, it's oh, yeah. it's every everywhere you go. Well, you've you've done a great job on this book, and I, I want to compliment you on it. There's so much we didn't cover. I wish we'd have had more time, but uh, we we talked here about the Pope, uh, and there's oh my goodness, let's see in here. Wow, it's just oh, it's just have a big section on Al Gore. Of course, he wrote that book, Earth in the Balance. About the goddess religion, how it was so preferable because they believed in saving the earth, uh, and he really favored the goddess. Uh, just, uh, you, you know, yeah. when we, when we went after him for that, oh, the Baptists and all just really, really, they just, man, they, they scarred us, you know, trying to stop us because, because brother Al Gore was a Baptist, you know. Yeah. He was a good bad Southern Baptist yeah. boy. Well, I tell you, we, we're, we're at a time where we have to really stay close to God and, and know that there is a truth out there. And your book uh, covers one aspect of it, uh, Mike. So I want to it sure does. And, uh, you know, we didn't get a chance to talk about it, but in the final chapter, I really get into the, the motive. Oh, um, yes, that's right, the psychological. It, you, you cover yeah. Bernays and all those people. Uh, and I, I think the book is just a great book, and I, I highly recommend it to all of our people. And I want to thank you. Great, it's a great introduction to the globalist one world order conspiracy. At it the is. Same time. That's yeah. right. That's right. That you can understand this is only one aspect, but right now this is an aspect that they are really gaining. So, so you can understand the whole new world order conspiracy with your book. Thank you so much for being on Power of Prophecy today. Thanks. It's always a pleasure. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. Well, folks, that was Mike King, a good friend of the ministry here and a great writer, uh, just a super intelligent. Uh, and uh, listen, we're going to keep offering his books. They're so important. And we want you to have this book, again, for just $22. That includes postage, shipping, and handling, and so forth. And we'll send it right out to you. Our address, of course, 1708 Patterson Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. And you can phone us toll-free, one 800 Two three four nine six seven three. I'm Tex Mars, and I invite you to tune in each week during the same time and discover the power of prophecy.